On today's video, we're going to be in Miami, Florida, and we're going to talk about why so many people resent the Cuban community. As I look through the comments in my channel, I notice there's a very large anti-Hispanic sentiment in the United States right now. Many people want to put out Hispanic cities like Miami and El Paso, Texas as evil and dangerous places. But statistics don't lie, Miami and El Paso are some of the safest cities in America as of 2023. With Scarface-like documentaries from the 70s and 80s, Cubans are portrayed as evil smugglers and vicious outlaws. But if you go to Miami today, all you're going to see is prospering families, prospering businesses, and one of the hardest working communities in the United States. So in today's video, we're going to take on some of these misconceptions that people have and inform you a little bit better about the Cuban community in Florida. Give you a historical perspective that perhaps could expand your understanding of the history of Florida. Many people believe that Cubans only came to Florida in the 1960s. However, that is vastly short of the truth. Cubans have been coming into Florida since the 17 and 1800s on fishing expeditions along the coast of Southwest Florida. During the Spanish rule, Florida, Alabama, and many other southern regions of the United States were governed by Havana, Cuba. Much of the cattle that was raised in Florida before the Civil War and after the Civil War went directly to Cuba and before there were train lines connecting Florida to the rest of the United States and roads connecting Southwest Florida to the rest of the United States, there was already telegraph lines between Havana, Cuba and Punta Rosa, Florida to help exchange cattle and to help the ships that were transferring these goods to know if there was hurricanes or any other inclement weather. Since the beginning, the city of Tampa, Florida, was actually the historic Cuban community. And there, the Cubans, along with the Italians, forged a community that to this day, the city of Tampa and Ybor City, is laced with the essence of Cuban Americans. From the elementary stages of the founding of the city of Tampa, Ybor City, and sugarcane and other products like pineapple that came from Cuba, meaning that tobacco production was directly related to the Cubans. The vast majority of the people that were in South Florida at that time in Central Florida, open cattle ranching was their prime source of livelihood stretching from Fort Myers, Arcadia, and as far into Kissimmee, all of this cattle was usually traded to Cuba for Spanish gold. Much of the wealth that was started in South Florida began from trading with the Spaniards and cattle. The cattle of Southwest Florida was free roaming and many times on their way down to Fort Myers, Punta Rosa, what is now McGregor, the tree line avenue where Many famous people have had their winter homes. This was actually a cattle ranching road that led to Punta Rosa where the cattle would be shipped to Cuba. During the Civil War, naval blockades blocked much of the entrances to the rivers of southwest Florida. During that time period, sugar came from Cuba, one of the main sources of food for the Confederate soldiers, were basically being smuggled from Cuba. So undoubtedly, many of the natives of southwest Florida are likely the descendants of these Cuban fishermen. Take Estero, Florida, for example, where a farm dating back to the early 1900s carries a Hispanic name. To assume that Cubans were only in Florida after the 1960s is completely to ignore a vast majority of Florida's history. Take Mound Key, for example, an island in the middle of Estero Bay that was initially made by the Calusa Indians as the Indian Shell Mound, which was inhabited for hundreds of years by Cuban fishermen and Spaniards who were herding goats on the island right up until the early 1900s. One of the national parks in Florida is here in Bradenton, the De Soto Memorial. In 1539, the landing of Fernando de Soto and the first extensive organized exploration by Europeans of what is now the southern region of the United States. 
Redundantly enough, the word Florida is of Spanish origin. And in fact, the vast majority of the English, even after Florida became English, only settled the northern part of the state, leaving the southern part of the state to continue as it had for many years, being inhabited by the Seminoles and by, of course, Cuban fishermen, like it had for hundreds of years unchanged until the invention of air conditioning, railroad coming into Florida, not much really changed for hundreds of years in Florida. And while the English colonies of the United States are going to teach you in school that Jamestown was the first settlement, by the time the English were playing Turkey Day with the natives in New England, the Spaniards already had grandchildren in Florida. One of the biggest differences that the Spaniards had with the English was their view of Africans. The Spaniards had a very complex relationship. Take Juan Garrido. He was a Afro-Spanish conquistador and the first documented black person to step foot in the United States. The Azcatitlan Codex shows him as a black conquistador in elegant French clothing, behind him white soldiers in metal armor. So while the English would only come to view Africans as a product of the slave trade, as far back as the 1500s, the Spaniards had conquistadors that were African. Not only was Juan Garrido the first black person to step foot in the United States, but he was also the founder of Mexico City, one of the largest cities in the world. Of course, you've never heard this in the United States because in the United States, African history is kind of concealed and wrapped up. But again, this is European history, not American history. You'll never hear this type of history explained to you in the United States. But they were in fact Spanish conquistadors who were African. Due to their dealings with Africans, the Spaniards were quite at odd with the English in Georgia and at that time, the Spaniards did have within their communities in St. Augustine many escaped slaves. When the Spanish finally hand Florida over to the English, many of those Afro-Americans and Spaniards that were in St. Augustine got on boats and left towards Havana, Cuba, which means that many Afro-Cubans are descendants of African-Americans, are descendants of very early Floridians of the United States from before the time the United States was even the United States. DNA actually comes from early American settlers, may be Spaniards in Spanish Florida or African-American slaves who are mixing with the Spaniards. So let's go ahead and debunk the notion that Cubans were only in Florida after the 1960s. Cubans have been in Florida since the founding of this place. In fact, Florida's first explorers came from Cuba and many of the first people born in Florida, rather of European or African descent, moved to Cuba, which means many Cubans are actually descendants of the first people born in what became, later on, the United States. Tampa was founded mostly by a mix of Cuban, Scottish, and Italians. The area of Jacksonville, as well, had a huge Spanish presence before it was even part of the United States, and many Cubans are descendants of people that were born right there in the St. Augustine area. And from Miami, Marco Island, Tampa, the vast majority of the cities that were founded in Florida were founded on top of shell mounts of the native Indians. Underneath those big high-rise buildings that you see in downtown Miami are actually archaeological sites dating back as far as the 1200s. Undoubtedly, all of these Florida cities that are founded on Indian mounds would have been the ideal place for Cuban fishermen to set up their camps, which were temporary. And let's be clear about that, that these are all coastal communities. Further inland into Florida, there was not much of an incentive for anybody to go. As cattle ranching expanded into Florida, it just about stopped in Kissimmee. Anything south of that was nothing more than swamps and marshland, only until the Seminole Indians were fleeing from Georgia, Alabama, South Carolina, came into Florida to hide were there any people in this area. On January 1st, 1899, the Spanish flag was removed from Cuba and the American flag was raised over the island, making all Cubans, in a sense, part of the United States. 
We have a lot of subscribers from Alabama. If you ever go to the cemetery in Wetumpka, Alabama, you'll notice many of the gravestones there say SPAM, Spanish-American War. This is what that war was about, raising the American flag over Puerto Rico and Cuba and expelling the Spanish influence from the Caribbean islands. The reason why the United States helped Cuba become an independent country and not a U.S. territory or state was because the United States did not want to become an empire like the Spanish, the English, the Portuguese, which all declined eventually. By 1902, Cuba had gained its independence. There was this legal article called the Teller Amendment, which is another reason why Cuba was not annexed into the United States like Puerto Rico. Under this agreement, the United States would help Cuba gain its independence, but then would have to withdraw its troops from the country. Interestingly enough, the proposed amendment gained support from several forces, namely those who opposed annexing territory contained large numbers of blacks and Catholics. Interestingly, that blacks in Cuba in the year 1900 had the ability to keep Cuba independent from the United States. Not only did they have the political power to keep Cuba from becoming part of the United States, but it is interesting as a fact that black Cubans did not want to be part of the United States. Interestingly enough, the sugarcane industry also had a huge role in this. Of course, after the 1960s, the Cuban sugarcane industry kind of transplants itself into South Florida and becomes a huge figure in Florida's history from there onward. In fact, just about all the industries that took place in Florida right up until the 1960s were somehow related back to trade with Cuba. Was it cattle or sugarcane? South Florida and Cuba have been trading for hundreds of years. It's probably good to say that the sugarcane interest back in the 1900s had a huge role in determining whether Cuba would become part of the United States or not. So we hop on back to Miami. The civil rights movement is a big issue in this time period. The U.S. government helps 400,000 Cubans enter South Florida in a very short period of time. In a time where race relationships between blacks and whites in the United States were at their absolute worst. Many African Americans in South Florida proclaimed that they were disgusted at the U.S. government for helping these Cubans from another country while treating them like crap. Interestingly enough, an anti-Cuban sentiment starts to be known across the African American communities of South Florida, mostly almost like a jealousy because the Cuban people are being helped by the U.S. government while the African American community was not being given any opportunity. So the African Americans felt, here comes this new group of people and they're getting all types of help from the government, but we're here and we're getting nothing. To add insult to injury, many of these people had just come back from World War II, where many of them were veterans, and they came back from defending the United States to find themselves being treated like second-class citizens after they fought to defend the United States in the Second World War. And to this day, many African-American people in the South Florida region complain that many of the opportunities and jobs that are given to Cubans are not given to them. The Cuban community also mobilized quickly to start businesses and all types of endeavors that made them not only economically but politically powerful. And as the Cuban community starts to buy businesses, buy land, and grow their economy and become a force in South Florida, not only were the African Americans offended but also many Americans as well who felt that they were forced to move out of South Florida by the Cuban growth. And to this day, both of these communities are harboring a distaste for Cubans as well as other Haitians who also did not receive the same benefits as Cubans. Basically, many people became jealous not only of the legal status that Cubans were able to receive, the government assistance, and how the community was able to quickly formulate here in South Florida. 
smart and agile in business, another layer of complexity arises in the Morel when the Cuban government pretty much emptied its entire prison system onto boats and let them come to South Florida. These criminals quickly went on to take entire segments of the U.S. criminal world and led many to the assumptions that all of the money that's made in Miami today comes from illicit activities. And that is really nothing unique to the Cuban-American community. It's happened with Chinese, it's happened with Italians, it's happened with Scottish and Irish, it's happened to all the communities that have established themselves in the United States. Cuban criminals were agile enough to determine that Americans did not like street-level crimes, which after all were the ones that were being targeted the most by law enforcement. The same thing that happened with the Cuban community is now happened with the Venezuelan community. Venezuelans came to the United States and they quickly ran out to take up the economy. They were rich people in their country. And the same thing can be said about Puerto Ricans in the Orlando area, especially after Hurricane Maria. They pretty much had their own economy and their own money. So when they came to the United States, they were an established community that moved in rapidly. The Cubans weren't the only community to do this. But now the Venezuelans and the Puerto Ricans are doing it as well. And the notion continues that almost a discredit to the hardworking Cubans that every dollar ever made in Florida by Cubans was in some way or another illicit. Cubans are very hardworking people. I know Cubans that came here with absolutely nothing. In fact, in Naples, Florida, I met a lot of Cubans that arrived and all they did was work, save money, stick close to their family to afford housing. Many Cubans have doubled up with their families in order to lower their housing costs. I wasn't alive in Miami to tell you what happened in Miami during the 60s, 70s, and 80s, but I'll tell you this. In the 2000s, 2010s, I saw Cubans come from Cuba with very little money, if none, maybe even debt when they came here, no English at all, started working jobs that didn't pay very well. They are paid off homeowners. They weren't smugglers. They weren't dealers. They weren't playing with fake credit cards. They were working hard, saving money, eating rice and beans every day. They worked two and three jobs. Some of them were doing tile. Some of them were doing construction. Some of them were working in restaurants. Some of them were doing everything they could legitly to start making money, saving money. They came as a family unit with three or four people working in a household Others I know, one single person working because they wanted the mother to stay at home with the kids. And today these people that I know in my personal life that came from Cuba with absolutely nothing have homes paid off, businesses they've started, and they came here with absolutely nothing. And I know these are completely upright people that are not involved in anything illicit. Just hard work and saving money and this notion that's being spread it's been spread since the 70s and 80s and still going on today cubans didn't work for our money we just came here and started you know smuggling and that's how we all got rich it's just a slap in the face to the hard-working cubans that are here you don't discredit people's hard work efforts education by saying stuff like that and if your mindset is to think that everybody who made it made it because they're into illicit activities you're never going to be successful being discriminated, being African American or Hispanic, that you're going to be successful if you're not putting in more work than them. I mean, if the people that are privileged have to work like animals, what makes you think that you're not going to work and on top of that you're being discriminated? It's completely illogical. Have a lot of Cubans made illicit money? Absolutely. And Cubans are not organized in the gangs or mobs. They're organized into what's known as criminal syndicates. And while in the Miami area, street crime is at a minimal, that's what a lot of Americans are, again, afraid of. People don't like to see people standing on a corner slaying it or break-ins or robberies or anything of that sort. Americans have a huge fear of street crimes. And where the Cuban community has kind of prevailed in the criminal world is that they've steered clear of street crimes and focused more on lottery rackets, gambling rackets, a lot of business extortion. These are the types of crimes you just don't hear about even if they take place. You have to understand that Cuba, before it was taken by Castro, was a mob-run island. And there's ties to Nevada, there's ties to New York and Chicago. And these Cubans that came in the 60s already had the mindset, the mob. The mob was in Cuba. Havana had casinos. 
and Cubans ran these loan sharking and all the other things that the Italian mob was doing. In fact, the Italian mob was in Tampa and did operate with Cubans. They were one of the few races that were actually kind of in that mix with Italians who pretty much didn't mess with anybody. So you have to understand that criminal sophistication already came with the Cuban before the Cuban arrived. I've seen people lose millions of dollars overnight, have the police raid their houses, have all types of consequences or spend their whole entire life in prison. And those aren't exactly the types of things that are worth doing. It's like when I see a young, successful African-American person, I'll often hear people say, oh, they're probably just drug dealing. And I stop them off the bat. You know what I mean? Like the notion of discrediting other people's successes is like the number one signal that somebody has envy in their heart. And envy is never good. You're never going to get successful by envying other people. And saying that we're all a bunch of criminals and we're all doing all these horrible things to get money is incorrect. And if you want to believe that, go right ahead and believe it. It's not going to change the reality that a lot of people are successful simply because they work hard. And this is kind of part of the American lie of discrimination. That if a Hispanic or an African American is successful, there's no way they did it legitly. Now let me tell you, there's a very successful African Americans. Mike Tyson with his fist. Another one with a basketball, another one with a microphone, another one with a pencil, another one with a business, another one with a bank. These are honest, hardworking people that establish their businesses, not by being criminals, but by hard work. I also feel that a lot of the people that say comments like that is simply because they know that they don't have the drive and motivation to be successful themselves. So the best thing they can do is discredit the achievements of others. Do I know Cubans who are millionaires today and they obtain it illicitly? Absolutely. But I also know a lot of Cubans that legitly hard work, dedication, saving, and cooperating with their families and close friends with good business partnerships have accomplished quite a bit. And to discredit all of the hard working people in these cities, no, not going to happen. Look at me. My wife is American. We've had inheritances that were pretty significant. I mean, we've inherited properties, money. Uh, she's American, born in the United States. I'm a U.S. citizen. I speak English. I went to school in the United States. And I see Cubans come here with barely any education, not knowing English. They did not receive a dollar from anyone. And, like, now they're successful without even knowing English. Like, I've literally seen Cubans come here and start off as dishwashers. And today they have homes paid off. Why? Because they saved their money. They had discipline, self-control. And they worked hard with their family to accomplish things. So now I can't sit here and hate on them and say that they did something illegal. No, dude, they, am I more privileged than them? Yes. Do I have a better position than them? Absolutely. But I want to go out, buy cars, buy rims, go on trips and vacations. And they're over there eating rice and beans, saving money. So now I can't sit here and talk about how they are Cubans that came here and did all types of illegal stuff. No, that's jealousy. You know what they were doing? They were saving money, eating rice and beans, working hard, and that's why today they're better off than I am. Why are they better off than me? Because I was going on vacation. I was buying designer clothes. I was putting rims on my car. I was putting $2,000 sound systems in my car. You know what they've been doing? They've been driving the same car they bought when they came from Cuba. And this is all on like minimal salary incomes. It means even if you don't make a lot of money in the United States, if you just save some of it, eventually you'll be able to get ahead. I think what a lot of people really resent about the Cuban community when they arrived is how hungry they were. I mean, they're coming from uh, like hard situations like they were hungry to do whatever they had to do because they, they weren't able to do what they were trying to do where they were from. So they come here to the land of opportunity. And of course, they're going to be winners at it because they're hungry. They desire. They have that thirst to be successful, to live the American dream. And it's no surprise that people that come from other countries a lot of times are much more successful than people who have just born into this country and they don't have that desire, that hunger, because they take everything for granted. But people that come here from other countries don't take crap for granted. They work hard for what they got. They have dreams. They have things they want to accomplish. Interestingly, though, when it comes to Everglades City, Florida history, they glorify Everglades City for what they did, and then they glorify that part of Florida history. They glorify that. What's the difference? You know, so it's a double standard, which comes from a clear, they make folkloric heroes out of the cowboys out of Everglades City who did the same thing the Cubans did. But then if a Cuban or an African-American person is successful, all oh, they're criminals. 
people that do the same exact thing, but that are Americans, they get fancy names like co cowboys or all right everybody so that is my video for today no absolutely not not every cuban made their money illicitly a lot of people made their money by hard work and you know it's not really fair for the hard-working people to just be thrown underneath the bus with the ones that didn't want to do things the right way criminals and corruption are going to exist in every country and every nationality and in every demographic and the same thing can be said about hard-working people a lot of people say Miami was built on drug money and that may be true for a large extent and just like corruption is present in every single city in the United States it's definitely present in Miami as well but I feel like a lot of these comments are nothing more than people who are envious and jealous that today the Cuban community in Miami is one of the most thriving communities in the country and that says that Miami is not just one of the best cities in the United States today one of the best cities in the world, driving music, entertainment, and trade internationally. Unfortunately, one of the staples of the United States is trying to hold down minorities, just like the African Americans were held back for hundreds of years and are still being held back today. The thing about Miami is that they weren't able to hold it back. 